Herbert Hoover assumed the nation's highest office at the peak of American prosperity. I have no fears for the future of our country. It is bright with hope. But the future brought unmitigated hard times. As the economy hit rock bottom, a time came when Americans would march on Washington, demanding help from the government. When the president would need the U.S. Army to defend the nation's capital. And when law-abiding citizens would hide outlaws from a government in which they had lost faith. Now, in the days of Hoover, it was a kind of a disastrous time. Now, what happened, we uh, didn't make very much crop. And what crop we made, the bottom fell out into the way. It just wasn't worth nothing. Broom corn, one crop was cut for seven and a half cents an hour. I've cashed you many a check for a fellow that worked 10 hours cutting broom corn. Got a check for 75 cents. People lost their farms. I mean, good, rich farms. They lost them. My uncle was a banker, and he foreclosed on a lot of good farms. But he had to do it because the banking commissioner told him to do it or close the bank. With hard times, even law and order in America seemed threatened. If you needed proof, it was pretty boy Floyd. If you gather round me children, a story I will tell. Pretty boy Floyd an outlaw. Oklahoma knew him well. He was an outlaw, a robber, and a killer. But in Depression America, Charles Pretty Boy Floyd became a kind of hero, celebrated in movies and song for helping the poor. It was in Oklahoma City. It was on a Christmas day. There come a whole carload of groceries with a letter that did say. Well, you say that I'm an outlaw, you say that I'm a thief. Here's Christmas dinner for the families on relief. My father was uh, with, with my mother and I when I was born. But after that, uh, it was only about a year, I think, after that he was put in prison. And the first time I ever saw him, I was probably about five, maybe five and a half years old. He impressed me because he was so well-dressed and he looked so nice and everything, you know, I thought he looked like a movie star. They called Floyd the Sagebrush Robin Hood because he generously rewarded those who helped him escape the law, all part of the desperation of hard times. There was a lot of stealing, you know, steal someone's hogs and butcher them. And so there was a lot of uh, that sort of thing going on because of people being hungry. And, of course, I think a lot of that was overlooked by the uh, enforcement authorities because they realized it was a matter of person eating. Floyd was the son of tenant farmers who had struggled to escape poverty and debt. At age 20, he turned his back on farm life, robbed a St. Louis grocery store payroll, was caught, and spent three and a half years in the Missouri penitentiary. Released in 1929, Floyd found a rural economy that was falling apart. Seven cent cotton and a forty cent meat. How in the world can a poor man eat? 
flour up high and cotton down low. How in the world can we raise the dough? Clothes worn out. Whole families had to work just to survive. Back nearly broken and fingers all sore. Cotton gone down to rise no more. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Take your children to the field and have them on the sack with you. Drag them on the sack and let them play up the middles and... They'd pick little piles of cotton, and I'd pick it up when I got to it. I mean, but I was with my children all the time. Those cotton sacks were vicious things. They were, they, they would hold uh, maybe two or three hundred pounds of hand-picked cotton, and you'd pull it across on your shoulder, up and down the cotton row, stooping over all the time. Once picked. Cotton found few buyers. For corn and wheat, the situation was no better. Throughout the 1920s, farmers had expanded, going into debt to buy new machinery and land. My father did a lot of puzzling about it because it was high, $400 an acre. But the bankers, the bankers in the community said, oh, Herman, you better buy now because next year it'll be at least $100 higher. By the 1930s, overproduction had created a crisis. Low prices did not even repay the cost of raising crops, let alone the interest farmers owed on borrowed money. Within a year, the land prices in that community dropped severely. In fact, it would have been difficult, even if it had been possible to sell, to get anything more than $100 an acre for what we'd paid $400 an acre for just 12 months before that. Then, in 1930, America's agricultural heartland was struck by drought. Cool masses of air have not flown southward as usually to cool us, nor swar moist airs from the ocean to bring us rainfall. See, we went there for months on end without rain, and uh, in July of 1930, we had every day was a hundred degrees or more. Corn and the cotton and the garden stuff and everything just dried up, turned yellow and died. The drought threatened to leave poor tenant farmers and sharecroppers without food or money to make it through the winter. In Washington, President Hoover turned to the nation's leading agency for disaster relief, the Red Cross. Mr. President, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to ask you to enroll... Mr. Hoover was sort of the spiritual godfather of the American Red Cross. Still is. And uh, he, he believed that people ought to help each other. Those that uh, had it should spread it around and shouldn't charge for it. My grandmother and grandfather were uh, Quakers. Uh, and... Uh, it just was a normal thing to, to uh, do good deeds, but you shouldn't call attention to it. People would turn to the Red Cross for all kinds of help. And the senators or politicians, Washington, worked through the Red Cross. And they became an agency almost of a political nature. In the drought area, the Red Cross began by distributing garden seeds so that people could grow food for the coming winter. The Red Cross gave out seeds, and uh, when we went for them, we got peas, we got turnip seed, collard seed, everything that belonged in a garden, even got eggplants. I didn't know anything about eggplants until the Red Cross issued those eggplant seeds. Drought wore on. Even the Red Cross gardens died. By September, many sharecroppers and wage laborers were hungry. But planters feared that further relief would keep people from working. And they blocked Red Cross efforts until the cotton was picked. Not until late November did food distribution begin. The Red Cross went into the furniture stores here and told them, said, you sell these people the groceries you've got in here, and we'll pay you for them. But we're not going to give them money. 
Of course, they'll throw it away or drunk, drink whiskey with it and everything. In most counties, the Red Cross worked within the plantation system and relied on the landowners to determine who got food. Your boss man, he would already go in front and he'd be untold how many families he had on his place that needed aid. And so when you got out there, they would uh, check each individual that was drawing for a household. Dear Red Cross, my children need books and clothes so they can go to school. If my mules don't die this winter and I can get something for them to eat, I'm going to try to make a crop here next year. I don't want the Red Cross to give me nothing, but if you'll help me and give me time, I'll pay you for all that you do for me. Signed, A.C. Blount. In Arkansas, the state hardest hit by drought, the agricultural crisis closed one quarter of the banks. Red Cross relief money was frozen. As aid ran out, people faced starvation. I look back at myself now and am surprised at how little awareness there seemed to be in Washington of what was going on around the country. Opinion in the newspapers was pretty much Republican. And it was in the interest of the Republican owners of the newspapers to play down bad news about the state of the economy and play up good news, because bad news would suggest that there was something wrong with the Hoover administration. The president insisted private charity could meet the crises. He denied anyone was starving because of the drought. An open letter to President Hoover to say that people are not suffering of hunger and actually starving in Arkansas is a blind denial of plain facts. The Red Cross and the states that are stricken have not the resources to meet the situation. As an American citizen and as a soldier in the late World War, I am utterly disgusted to think it probable that my national government should shirk its inescapable duty in this time of peril. Respectfully, Oliver Moore. In December of 1930, the drought produced what Hoover had fought to avoid, a call for the federal government to feed people. He thought people should work and um, n not get on the dole. He thought that, that really demoralized people. He felt that the soul's growth depended on uh, your self-reliance and pride in your self-reliance. And uh, once you start uh, giving up and asking aid from someone else, uh, you've given up the fight. You've given up the, the reason to live. With the Red Cross overwhelmed, Arkansas's Democratic Senator Joseph T. Robinson now sought $60 million in federal aid. Hoover threatened to veto any legislation that gave direct federal aid to individuals. The bill he signed authorized loans of $45 million for seed and animal feed. It made no mention of food. Mr. Hoover was at best, or at worst, very, very conservative. And he never had missed any meals, neither had his wife. And, and, and nothing changes your attitude like going hungry a couple of days. And he never had had that. And he just couldn't believe that there were people in his, under his administration that were not eating regular. Winter deepened. Shortages increased across the drought states. The gas company sent a man out to turn off the gas in a house where a woman and a number of children lived. And uh, when he arrived, she was unable to pay the bill. He, he, she said, please give me time to finish cooking. He said, no, I, my instructions are to turn it off right away. And he, she, went into where she was cooking, and to his horror, he saw in a basket the head of a dog. 